So we now have uh, Dr. Hal Penny, who will be coming up from our uh, Department of Radiology to share some information about how we look at CT scans in terms of understanding how patients are benefiting or not benefiting from immunotherapy. And there have been a lot of discussions about whether these are good modalities to capture the degree of patient benefit. And I think we'll hear a lot about how we think about that from a radiology perspective now. And then this talk will follow with another one on some more experimental imaging for looking at immune responses. So yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm going to uh, just very briefly start by uh, discussing how we've conventionally been assessing response to tumor um, treatment in the era of cytotoxic chemotherapy, and then talk about how we've tweaked that approach in the context of uh, checkpoint inhibitors. Um, so as, as you are all very familiar with, we have s several formal ways of assessing treatment response. Um, most frequently used one being recess 1.1. So using recess, we select up to up to five target lesions. We perform a, a unidimensional measurement in each lesion. Um, we add them all together to get a, a total tumor burden, um, and then we track that over time to see if it gets better or worse. The WHO criteria are an older version of recist. I mention them only because um, some of the immune-related response criteria that I'll I'll discuss were based off of WHO. So with WHO, you can measure up to 10 target lesions. You perform a, a bi-dimensional measurement in each lesion. You multiply those together, add them up, get a total tumor burden, which you then track over time. And in the, ex in the example here of recist, depending on whether things get, get better or worse, we put the patients into one of four categories, complete responders, those with a partial response, those with progressive disease, so that's 20% increase in tumor burden, or any new lesion developing anywhere, or those with stable disease. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, early in experience with checkpoint inhibitors, it became clear that we were seeing some atypical responses to, to therapy, and um, based off of a, a meeting of um, immu immunotherapy uh, experts in the mid-2000s. This paper was published um, about 10 years ago, and in it um, were outlined what you could consider to be the kind of central tenets of re response assessment in the context of checkpoint inhibition. So the first point is that it can take longer for anti-tumor activity to show up on CT scans than it does for you know, cytotoxic chemotherapies. I think that's something we're, we're all familiar with. Um, secondly, a, a period of dur durable, stable disease can represent viable and real anti-tumor activity. Um, again, I think something we're all uh, experienced with. Um, possibly the biggest difference w was that we can see a response to immunotherapy after a, a, a period of conventional progressive disease, and because of that, stopping the immunotherapy may not be appropriate until we can be sure that that progressive disease is real. So in that same paper, they outline a few different patterns of response, the, the first one being this cytotoxic pattern, which you know, it's pretty straightforward, just an immediate decrease in the tumor burden. That's easy to pick up on imaging. The second one being this period of r relatively uh, long period of stable disease, a slow reduction in tumor burden. Again, interesting, but not that challenging from an imaging perspective. Um, the, th the third and kind of hardest pattern from a ra radiologist's perspective is uh, what happens here? So you know, this is the pretreatment tumor, and one of th we can go one of three ways. It can get infiltrated with immune cells, and everything can shrink down. Again, that's easy to pick up on imaging. Second thing that can happen is that treatment doesn't work. The tumor gets bigger. That's progressive disease and easy to pick up on imaging. But the third option is that the tumor gets infiltrated by immune cells. All the tumor dies, but the lesion gets bigger, and as it stands with conventional imaging and um, <clears throat> CT-based and MRI-based imaging, we don't have any robust way of differentiating this scenario from this scenario. So this is a patient with lung cancer who has a left lung uh, tumor at, at baseline, and then two months after treatment, that tumor has uh, increased in size, so this would be recessed progressive disease. She was doing well and continued on therapy, and six weeks later the, has achieved a, a partial response. This patient has a metastasis in the psoas muscle and had normal bones at baseline. Uh, two months later, after checkpoint inhibitor therapy had been started, the tumor has doubled in size and there's a new bone lesion. 
patient was well and was rescanned uh, six weeks later, and both those lesions have disappeared. So both of these patients are examples of patients with pseudo progression, with this initial increase in tumor burden, followed by uh, followed by a decrease. And as I mentioned, this is because of immune cell uh, infiltration. So. You know, in the, the early reports in, in melanoma, it was thought to occur in up to 10% of patients. It's definitely lower than that in other cancer subtypes. As an example, in a group of non-small cell patients we looked at recently, depending on who read the scans, about 1% to 3% of them had a, had a formal episode of pseudoprogression. There was another small percentage of them had what you could term non-formal pseudoprogression, where they have a slight bump in their tumor burden, followed by... Um, uh, 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 an improvement, but definitely uh, pseudoprogression is not co not that common outside of the melanoma setting. Um, it um, overwhelmingly occurs early in the treatment time course, usually at the first follow-up scan. We do occasionally see patients who have uh, pseudoprogression later in the time course, but that's rare. And we occasionally see patients who have an undulating uh, pattern of disease, as you guys will be familiar with. But again, that's uh, relatively rare as well, I would say. And then the next question is, is it important for us uh, clinically and radiologically to be able to identify these pseudoprogressors? Uh, and the answer is yes. This is from a melanoma cohort. Uh, the top line, the unbroken line, are those who had a, a conventional response to immunotherapy. This line here are people who, had, who progressed. And then the hashed line are the so-called pseudo-responders who had this initial increase followed by decrease. And then uh, as you follow them out at about three years follow-up, the pseudo-progressors uh, have um, a you know, similar survival to those who had a conventional imaging response. So to try and identify those patients, um, the uh, so-called immune-related response criteria were developed. So there's been three iterations of these. Um, the first one was uh, called IOR or C. So this was based on the, uh, these were based on the WHO criteria. They're a, they're a bi-dimensional tumor assessment, and at baseline you can select up to, up to 15 target lesions. Um, at the follow-up assessment, you repeat this, uh, this assessment of targets, and then if there are any new lesions, rather than saying this patient has progressive, progressive disease, which is what we would say with resist, uh, instead of saying that, we actually measure the new target lesion. So we, and we, we then take the target lesion burden, add it to the new lesion burden to get a total tumor burden. And this is what we track over time to see if things have gotten better or worse. So based on whether things are getting better or worse, again, we put them into one of four categories. Complete response, partial response, progressive disease. So again, note that there's no mention here of new lesions denoting progressive disease. Progressive diseases, if there's been a 25% increase in that total tumor burden. And again, there's an important caveat here that if the patient is doing well clinically, that uh, it's recommended that the period of progressive disease is confirmed with a confirmatory scan at four weeks. So there were, this was a really good, really important step forward in response assessment. There were several practical issues with IORC that um, ultimately led to two further iterations. Um, the first uh, that I'll mention, again, I'm sure you guys will be familiar with, is IOR Resist. Uh, it was published in abstract form about five years ago, similar and basic concept to the IOR or C, and it's very widely used in clinical trials. So uh, its main advantage is, is that it was based off of the Resist 1.1 criteria, so it's you know, practically quite easy to use. Big disadvantages were that it was, wasn't developed under the context of a formal working group, in my experience, is relatively inconsistently applied across trials, and there are some of the definitions aren't that clear in it. So the last, and you know, we hope will be what we hope will be the kind of final word in this setting is uh, the so-called eye resist guideline that was published two years ago, um, uh, and it was developed by the resist working group. Um, so this is worth reading if you have an interest in this area. It's a very clear guideline for what to do in this uh, in this space. Um, it, it added in some response assessment categories that we hadn't seen before. Uh, unconf UPD and CPD are unconfirmed progressive disease and confirmed progressive disease. They stipulate that you should com confirm progressive disease at four weeks 
but no later than eight weeks. And this is to make sure that you don't miss the period for salvage therapy if the patients are really progressing. Uh, importantly, it tells us what a confirmed progressive disease at four weeks is. So you need the tumor to grow, for example, by another five millimeters, uh, or for more new lesions to develop in the patients. So again, it's, it's, it's a very comprehensive document and, and worth looking at um, if you have an interest in this area. Um, I'll just take you through how we would use it in, in, in practice with just one, one example. At baseline, we have this lung lesion. We follow it up, and at the first time point, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's progressed, so we have a period of unconfirmed progressive disease. Um, so with resist, we would just stop here, that would be it, but with iResist, we continue on. At the third time point, things have improved, so we now have a partial response. So the patient uh, continues on therapy, but at the fifth time point, unfortunately, a new liver lesion has developed. So this is another period of unconfirmed progressive disease. So the patient's clinically well, gets a follow-up scan at four weeks. And the, unfortunately, the liver lesion's growing again, so this is confirmed progressive disease because the tumor burden has increased again by more than five millimeters. So there are different ways, as I mentioned, that you can confirm progressive disease in this context. So for example, if the liver lesion hadn't grown. You can also confirm progressive disease if new lesions develop elsewhere, like this mediastinal lesion. So I just want to, for the last two minutes, just mention a couple of scenarios that can be, that can cause confusion in the context of response assessment. Uh, these are three separate patients who all had normal lungs before they started uh, checkpoint inhibitors and who developed multiple new lung lesions. And initially, they look a little concerning, but if you look closer, some of them have ground glass change around them. And these are all patients who have uh, a checkpoint inhibitor-associated pneumonitis. From a radiology perspective, the most common pattern is an organizing pneumonia pattern, which can occasionally present in this nodular form. So the take-home point would be not to jump to calling progressive disease if you see this type of nodular pattern developing. Uh, this is a patient who had uh, melanoma resected in 2014 and a year later came back in with a paratracheal mass. FDG Avid biopsied uh, came back as melanoma. So he was started on a checkpoint inhibitor and a few months later had responded. A few months after that came back in with this uh, bilateral hyalur subcarinal adenopathy which at first glance looks concerning. This was biopsied and came back as reactive and this patient was diagnosed with an immunotherapy-associated sarcoid-like reaction. So you can see this bilateral hyalur and uh, subcarinal symmetrical adenopathy. We sometimes see it on PET as well, this bilateral symmetrical moderate uptake. And again, the take-home point would be if you see this pattern in the context of disease being uh, things going well elsewhere, don't jump to calling it progressive disease. Last case is a guy with me uh, metastatic melanoma who was treat treated with pembrolizumab. He developed a new pancreatic mass, FDG avid on PET-CT. Uh, this was ultimately biopsied, and the biopsy demonstrated acute inflammation, and this was immunotherapy-associated pancreatitis. So again, just the take-home point being, um, you know, if you see these types of lesions developing in organs where we know that we get inflammatory side effects, uh, don't automatically jump to uh, calling progressive disease. So I'll finish by saying that response assessment in this space can be challenging. We have novel response assessment criteria that can help us and which can be useful tools. And just bear in mind those inflammatory side effects of, of treatment, which it, it can occasionally cloud treatment response. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, we have a time for a question or so. Uh, just a quick one. What's your... Oh, you have one over here. Okay. Thank you, Keith. Uh, thanks for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, is this approach useful in tumors like glioblastoma and so forth? I, I, you know, obviously these, these malignancies are, can be perhaps more easily evaluated pathologically uh, to see whether to, to correlate with the, with the um, imaging findings. But I'm wondering in a, in a situation where you have a... Uh, someone with a glio, whether this, and where, where pseudoprogression, as you know, is uh, also a, a problem, whether this kind of approach could also be useful. Uh, 
Sure. So what, what, what I will say is, um, I don't want to be a, a cop out, but I'm, I, I have very little experience with neuroimaging. Um, I'm not a neuroradiologist. I know my neuroradiologists struggle with that, um, with that question of pseudoprogression in, in the context of glioblastoma. Uh, and, and I know that they can, they can use uh, multi-parametric MRI uh, to a, a, at least attempt to differentiate pseudoprogression from uh, true progression. Uh, it's not something I'm familiar with at a on a clinical level because it's not something I, I, I do myself. But I, but I, I, do, I, I take your point that, it's, it, that that's a, it's, a, it's a very challenging clinical situation. But as I'm aware, multi-parametric MRI, which utilizes um, um, perfusion imaging, for example, can be a useful tool.